Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this uh, session on um, cryospheric systems and uh, climate. Uh, this is the first of uh, two oral sessions, and uh, we also have a poster session tomorrow as well. Um, so I'd just like to uh, introduce our first speaker this afternoon, who's uh, Thomas Molg, and uh, he's going to talk about uh, climate drivers of the mountain cryosphere. Thank you very much also for the invitation and uh, good afternoon. When we think about the role of glaciers in the climate system, the ultimate boundary conditions are always provided by the large scale climate dynamics, which is number one in this illustration. At the other end of the story, there is the mass balance of a mountain glacier, number two, which in the first place is a local phenomenon. But then there are the processes in between. The mesoscale circulation, which forms A, the atmospheric boundary layer over the mountain, and B, also constrains conditions in the glacier surface layer, where energy and mass flexes eventually control the mass balance. That's the causality chain. Previous research that attempted to quantify this multi-scale system relied on a mix of physical and statistical downscaling. The large-scale dynamics were typically resolved by physical models. The mass balance was semi-empirical most often, but the mesoscale circulation was always bypassed by statistical downscaling. So the state of the art in terms of processes is a little bit like this, I would say. This person has built a frame around a localized phenomenon. And I would argue that this resembles our problem of glaciers and the large scale boundaries. So we are interested in filling the empty spaces in between with process knowledge and therefore asking, can we unify the scales in one model system that resolves the main processes of these scales? Today I would like to discuss this question by two case studies. One is from tropical Africa, the other one is from the Tibetan Plateau. And I will underline the role of mesoscale processes for glaciers, or in simple words, what happens when air masses collide with mountains and get modified. So central to our approach is a mesoscale atmospheric model with multiple grid nesting capabilities, which means you cover your area of interest by one parent grid, in which one or more grids, finer grids, are nested. So with every grid, you decrease domain size, but horizontal resolution gets better. And because these models are driven by large-scale data sets at the lateral boundaries, they do resolve the atmospheric processes on local, regional, and large scales. The second model in the game is a physically-based glacier mass balance model. At its upper boundaries, that's the black rectangle, it sees the local conditions of air temperature, air pressure, relative humidity, wind speed, precipitation, and cloud cover. And from this input, it solves the full energy balance. And then from the energy balance, the model generates mass flexes of sublimation, melt, surface deposition, refreezing in the snowpack, subsurface melt, and together with solid precipitation. This gives you a good indication of the mass balance. It's very typical that the development and application of such a model and we have documented this for our case in the literature over the past eight few years, roughly, goes hand in hand with measurements from automatic weather stations. They not only provide evaluation data, but also the most reliable local forcing. And as you all know, these stations nowadays are operated at remote places around the world. For example, in this place, which is Kilimanjaro. Located in Equatorialist Africa at the kenya tanzania border, currently we are maintaining four automata, automatic weather stations with collaborators. The atmospheric model setup here uses four domains and three nested grids, so we are going 
from 39 kilometers horizontal resolution in the parent grid down to 800 meters over the target area, which is the peak that you can see on this photo. The desire to go to really high resolution, like in this example, comes from the fact that actually this is the only possibility to resolve the glacierized zone explicitly. If you do two or three kilometers, in this case, you simply don't get glaciers in the model. So now we can take the simulated atmospheric conditions in the glacierized zone and provide them as direct input to the mass balance model without any statistical correction. That's the concept, and of course the question is, can we reproduce realistic mass balances in this way? So the first simulations we did two years ago pointed towards yes, because um, here we have two monthly mass balances. The wet season, the two upper curves, mass gain, and then the dry season, the two lower curves, mass loss on the glacier. Two different forcing data, one time from atmospheric weather station measurements and the other time from atmospheric model output, uncorrected. And of course there are discrepancies on the daily scale, but the overall pattern, as well as the magnitudes, they are in rather good agreement. And that was the first positive uh, aspect of the whole story. So then we wanted to extend the simulation period and also transfer the approach to another place, which is this one. That is Shadang Glacier, located on the southern Tibetan Plateau and currently covered by two automatic weather stations. However, the grid setup for the atmospheric model is different in this case because the Tibetan Plateau is a huge element in the landscape, much larger than the isolated Kilimanjaro. So here, three domains in total are sufficient to resolve the glacierized elevations on a two-kilometer grid. And that was the setup. Of course, this makes the model computationally more effective, faster, and therefore we did a 11-year simulation and modeled the mass balance between 2001 and 2011. About two and a half years in this period are covered by observations, and these we can use for model output evaluation. Uh, just a quick example, this is measured versus modeled glacier surface temperature on a daily scale. Unfortunately, there are two gaps in the measurements, but that's of course the price you pay for measuring at remote places, sometimes unavoidable. We can also use mass fluxes to validate the model. Here, the accumulated surface height change. And again, there are differences on the daily scale or sometimes also in a particular week, but the overall performance, again, is rather promising. And actually, this does suggest that we do have the possibility now to downscale large-scale climate dynamics to the conditions at our glacier surface in a fully dynamical way. Now, one of the biggest advantages in these multi-scale modeling systems is that you can also diagnose the importance of mesoscale processes and their relevance to the, to the alpine cryosphere. And I only want to show you one example on uh, Kilimanjaro. The air masses are typically approaching from easterly directions but the maxima of glaciers, precipitation, they are located on the southwestern slope, which is non-intuitive in the beginning. For simplicity, I'm only showing results from an idealized simulation where Kilimanjaro was considered as a bell-shaped mountain. And this is the plan view, so the contours as uh, these are the elevations of the mountain. The air mass here is approaching from the northeast. It's a very typical situation on Kilimanjaro. When you, should you climb it one day, there's a high chance that you have a easterly inflow of air. 
And you can also see the wind vectors at the surface, 10 meters above the ground. And I would like to emphasize three points here. First, on the windward side, we observe flow splitting. So the air has to go around the mountain. Second, two eddies are formed in the lee. They are located here. And third, these two eddies produce a counter flow on the southern slope, which transports moisture uphill. And that's indicated by the gray shaded area. So it is the combination of the mountain shape and the prevailing thermodynamic stability of the approaching air masses that force the air to go around the mountain in this case and therefore produce convergence, precipitation and glaciers on the southern slope. And I think we can all agree that this would be hard to capture with simple or statistical models. Of course, you can do the same with the realistic multiscale model system, and uh, this is what we published last year in JGR. Downscaling climate dynamics to glacier scale mass and energy balance without statistical scale linking. Something that we didn't include in this paper and also not in this talk today is the role of the feedbacks to the atmosphere due to mass balance processes. Now this is certainly negligible for small glaciers as we saw here, but it appears to be more important on the regional scale. And there is a poster on this topic today in the cryosphere area by Emily Collier. However, the advantage of the non-interactive model is that uh, you can do many mass balance simulations by Monte Carlo approaches. And this is also the reason why you saw arrow bars in figure seven two slides ago, because we just ran the mass balance model a thousand times. Both aspects deserve consideration for future studies, but for now, I'd like to make some final remarks. We have seen that by combining two state-of-the-art modeling systems, it is possible to quantify the large-scale effects on the mass fluxes of small alpine glaciers in a fully dynamical way, and therefore do not diagnose the drivers of glacier change at multiple scales. The approach is computationally expensive and numerically difficult, but at least these days you can do it uh, up to decades with the current generation of supercomputers. These simulations also remind us, and it is something we sometimes tend to forget, that the air over mountains and around glaciers is highly dynamical. So not everything can be solved by simple modeling, that's what we all know. Sometimes it is necessary to dig into deeper process levels. The good news is that the approach seems to be applicable to different climatic and topographic settings. And finally, it also allows us to diagnose the widespread linkages that glaciers maintain in the climate system. And this helps to exploit the value of glaciers as climatic indicators and potentially opens new avenues for the use of glaciers as paleoclimate proxies. So in this context, the size of a mountain glacier doesn't matter at all. And this implies that even small ice fields can sometimes be of great value to climate research. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Are there any questions? Thank you. Yes, uh, I, first I think that the approach is applicable to different climates and second, I think there is more room for incorporating further models to the chain, like glacier flow models or hydrological models, yes. Okay, thank you, Lilita, thank you very okay. much. 
just before we uh, get on to our next talk, um, I'd just like to apologise to my co-chair for not introducing him. Uh, but of course, this is uh, Neil Glasser and I'm uh, Jasper Knight. So um, our next talk is given by Rainer Prinz, and he's going to talk about uh, tropospheric climate change and uh, tropical mountain glaciers. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Rainer Prinz, and um, I want to talk about uh, how we can quantify or how we try to quantify mid tropospheric climate change from small tropical mountain glaciers. Um, it's a similar approach um, we follow on, on Mount Kenya and Louis Glacier, and we, we use a similar approach than Thomas just uh, showed us. But actually, I'm going to talk about um, some limitations and restrictions to that. And it's still work in progress, so that's why the title is still a question and not an answer. Um, when we look into the, into the global water vapor transport here from satellite observations, um, we can see that the tropics are a major source of, of uh, water vapor over the, uh, in the globe. And um, we can imagine if there's any major change in tropical uh, circulation, this has global impact due to the boulevard heat transfer. And the question is now, can we somehow detect any changes in the tropical circulation? So unfortunately, we do not have a lot of um, observation from weather station in the tropics. And if um, the time series are quite short when the, uh, that the stations cover, but we have glaciers. And in the last decades, in the last 100, 130 years, these glaciers receded quite dramatically. And this gives us the opportunity to look deeper um, into the recession of glaciers and try to decipher a climate, climate signal out there. So uh, our approach is um, when we know the extent of a glacier and we know the climate forcing of the glacier, we can derive a surface energy balance out there. But can we go the other way around? Meaning if we have field evidence from uh, former historical glacier extents, maybe from moraines, and assuming a steady state, uh, we can say um, the surface mass balance is zero. And can we, for this surface, um, close the, the energy balance and from that detect any changes in the climate forcing of the glacier? Well, uh, from, the, from the previous talk, Thomas showed you that this was possible on, on Kilimanjaro. And we focus now on Mount Kenya because the two mountains are um, not located far ab apart. But there are, there's one major difference when you just look at the sketch, and this is the lower level of glaciation. Um, why do the glaciers end on Kilimanjaro on around 5,500 meters, and on Mount Kenya, glaciers go down to, above, uh, to about 4,500 meters? So why is there a 1,000 meter difference in elevation of glaciation? So there must be some going on something different on those two mountains. So for... Um, what we need to follow our approach is basically high temperature resolution meteorological data, for example, the weather station on Lewis Glacier and Mount Kindia there. And we need physical and process-based um, uh, models that explain the uh, energy fluxes towards and from the glacier surface, as Thomas just showed before. And we also need um, actual and historic glacier extent. This picture here is... is, is uh, an example for, from Lewis Glacier on Mount Kenya. The gray area here is Lewis Glacier in 2010, and the red outline is a moraine from 1880 when Lewis Glacier was about six times bigger than now. And so the question is, what forced Lewis Glacier to retreat in the last 130 years? Well, this is a, the uh, energy balance model from uh, a point on the on Lewis Glacier, showing you uh, in, in the open circles the natural water wave fluxes modulated by the albedo in the black boxes. And the, bl the black dots show the net long wave radiation, uh, the not net long wave fl uh, radiation fluxes. And the bars show in, in the light blue the sensible heat flux, in the darker blue the conductive heat flux. And on the negative side, latent heat flux in green, the heat flux to penetrating short wave radiation in orange and the resultant uh, heat flux available for melt in red. When you convert this into mass, um, we get the, uh, the, the mass balance modeled for Lewis Glacier. Um, 
on the positive side, snow accumulation and a little bit of refreezing and deposit. Um, and on the ablation side, we can see some sublimation in yellow, a lot of internal melt sometimes, and uh, surface melt in dark red. But um, what we see is that we do not have um, a prevailing seasonality in, in either uh, energy flux on, on Lewis Glacier, and we um, do not have a consistent seasonality like shown in the, in the, in the uh, blue boxes here, which are the somehow theoretical um, rainy season in East Ecuador and East Africa. And if, for example, look at the rainy season in 2010, March, April 2010, we almost have no accumulation in this rainy season and, 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 and some substantial melt going on there, but um, the following dry season was actually quite wet there. So there's no prevailing seasonality, and this gives uh, some implication in our modeling. When we think of um, from the one-dimensional model just um, um, modeling the energy balance and going from the, from the uh, um, one dimension from the point to a distributed energy balance or modeling climate sensitivities of the surface, um, we, we need to let the surface evolve freely. That's, so we need basically um, an, an albedo model. And what we tried here is to optimize uh, our surface energy balance model in a, a Monte Carlo approach to get an optimal fitting for uh, parameters needed for the albedo model, for uh, snow densities and whatever, um, but we were not quite happy with that, and we found out that it's really um, a matter of the albedo model. A similar thing, a co-worker um, detected on another inner tropical glacier, which is uh, Shayab Glacier in Peru. Um, the two boxes show you two points on the glacier where we have observation of um, surface height change, and um, the model was, um, the surface energy balance model was uh, optimized for both points, and um, one, it was optimized for this point, and then um, uh, let the surface height change compute on the, on the lower point, and it failed, and the, also the other way around, optimizing the model to this observations and modeling this point, and the model failed again. And looking deeper into that, this was really a, a, an issue of the um, albedo model. Um, this, is, this graph shows you um, the evolution of uh, albedo um, over four months. These are daily mean values in blue, the observation of albedo in black, what the albedo model produces, and the concurrent model snow height. So you can see that in this period, the model does, does fairly well computing the, the surface albedo, not getting the spikes here, but in general, it's okay. But in this period here, which, which is almost two months, um, the albedo model doesn't uh, capture what's going on on the surface. And um, this is because we do not have a reliable seasonality on Lewis Glacier, and we have these high frequent variations of albedo to do high frequent shallow um, snow cover and fast snow metamorphosis. You can imagine that on this tropical glacier, every afternoon you have uh, a little snowfall, two, three, five centimeters, uh, bringing albedo high up, and in the, in the next um, late, uh, in the next day, in the, in the, in the late uh, morning, close to noon, the snow is melting, albedo is changing dramatically, maybe the snow cover melts entirely, and albedo is, is dropping down to ice albedo, and the model does, doesn't capture that. So our current work now is um, to really get a, a better albedo parameterization. Um, the best we have so far is what we use from uh, Erlemanns and Knapp, where uh, the snow albedo is a function of two constants, namely a time scale and a depth scale. Um, but for our case, at least, we think that the time scale must be a function of um, best of the, of the short and long wave incoming fluxes. And there's a second branch we follow, <laughs> denoted by the question mark here. Um, we need to go deeper into the physics of, of albedo on the surface. And this means establishing a better physical or deterministic relationship um, how the snow cover alters and change on the glacier surface. So this leaves me with the conclusion that so far, um, if we do not have albedo parameterizations that are optimized on intertropical conditions, um, surface energy balance uh, model performance is weak. 
And this is why um, model climate sensitivities of these glaciers are inconsistent or actually failing. And that's why we also cannot have a distinct attribution of drivers on the surface mass balance, at least on, on Mount Kenya. It's working on, on, on Kilimanjaro. Kilimanjaro is, is 1,000 meters higher. The atmosphere is, uh, is much more drier. It's much more colder. Air temperatures on Kilimanjaro are always fairly below zero. And uh, on, on Lewis Glacier, we are on an elevation where air temperature always around, is around zero. And these high frequent albedo changes, they clearly cause a problem to our model. Thank you. Much, Rainer. We have uh, time for questions. Um, the chair is also allowed to ask questions. So, so you mentioned that uh, an, an aim would be to be able to reconstruct climate at former glaciers from moraines yeah. or, or such like. How close are we to being able to do that? Well, in, in principle, if we get the, the albedo model working, um, we can go and, and model the, the, the distributed surface energy balance of the glacier. And um, as I've shown in the, in, in the previous slide here, um, when, when, we can, when, we can, when, when we are able to do this step in a distributed way, working for, for, for Lewis Glacier, then we can also try to find a distributed surface energy balance for there. And um, from that, um, using statistical or dynamical methods, you can go back to, to really the climate forcing. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? Uh, I, I actually uh, have a related question, and this is, um, as, as you showed uh, right at the start, uh, Lewis Glacier has been in, in retreat throughout uh, the historic period. Uh, do you think that retreat is related to uh, changes in um, energy balance related explicitly to albedo or other, other um, effects that we need to consider? Um, well, from, from uh, previous works, mainly from Stefan Hastenrat, um, we know that the retreat is due to um, uh, changes in the, in the radiation balance and into the turbulent fluxes. But uh, on the other hand, that's somehow obvious because there are not, <laughs> not much other reasons that, that can uh, do that. But um, what we really aim for is to really pin down either one or a combination of, of, of uh, drivers that will say, okay, uh, under these circumstances, this or that happened that really was the forcing of the, of the glacier retreat. And that's why we need to, to, to get the albedo model working. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. We'll leave that there. Thank you. Our uh, next uh, speaker is Nadia Insel, and uh, she's going to talk about uh, temperature changes um, and uh, looking at uh, Kalkaya. Yeah, good afternoon. So I will talk about uh, changes in the tropical temperatures over the last 17,000 years uh, based on the extent of the Kakaya ice cap in Peru. And so generally, reconstructing uh, surface temperatures from relatively stable periods in the past, such as the last glacier maximum uh, here, LGM, uh, represents a very important, uh, very important means of um, constraining climate sensibility and evaluating model simulations. And so here I'm showing a map of LGM temperature anomalies from Clark et al. And what we can see is a very strong um, range of temperature differences between the modern and the LGM all over the globe. And so we want to focus on the tropics, mostly on the tropics, because they play a very uh, interactive link, or they are in a very interactive link between the southern and the northern hemisphere. And so they are kind of two end member models in terms of the temperature differences between the modern and the Algerian and the tropics. And so the MARGO project 
suggests a temperature, a mean annual cooling during the LGM of around 1.1 plus minus 1.1 degrees C, which is a very low estimate of temperature differences between the modern and the LGM, and that accounts for the tropical Pacific. And that is some very strong contrast to cooling of around 4 degrees C for the tropics that has been uh, suggested from the CLIMAP uh, project. And so we are investigating tropical glaciers because they provide very valuable information for paleoclimate. And so we focus on the Kaikaya ice cap because it's the largest glaciated area in the tropics and it is located in the, um, in the Cordillera Oriental of the Andes Mountains in Peru. It has an area of around 55 square kilometers with a summit elevation of 6, uh, 5,670 meters. And it's generally very easily identified because it has this kind of like upside down frog shape. You can see the legs here, the head here. And so this map shows moraines that have been deposited by Kakaya over the last 17,000 years. And so we have three sets of moraines that are generally known as the Huascane um, moraine one, two, and three. And so we are seeing the Kakaya ice cap here, the light gray, and um, we are seeing three valleys where we have glacier advances. And so we are mainly focusing on the Huancane Valley down here. And these moraines have been very well mapped and dated. And so the youngest moraine shows the Kakaya ice extent uh, during the last, um, uh, during the Little Ice Age. We have the Huancane uh, moraines too that actually show a very nice continuous former ice extent and we have a minimum age of the ice recession of 12,500 years. And we have the Huancane three moraines that have been dated at around 17,000 years, and they mark either the last glacial maximum extent of Kakaya or a still stand uh, while retreating from the last glacial maximum. And so the, object, uh, the objective of my work or the work in general of the climate group in Chicago is to quantify the changes in climate that explain the geographical and temporal patterns of the glacier advantage of the Kakaya ice cap. And so the questions are, can we simulate the reconstructed changes uh, in the timing and magnitude of the glacier advances and is Kakaya actually more sensitive to changes in temperature or in precipitation? So I present results from a landscape evolution model coupled to an aerographic precipitation model. And we have a horizontal resolution of 180 meters and 427 by 343 grip points. Our initial conditions, our initial climate conditions um, are listed here. So we start with a base level temperature of 27.5 degrees. We have an annual temperature variation of 2 degrees C. We have an atmospheric lapse rate of 5.22 degrees C per kilometers. And uh, we are driving the glacier advances by a change in temperature with a period of like 40,000 uh, years. So we have some kind of a Milankovitch forcing here. And um, our kind of our uh, free parameter uh, to see how, how much uh, or what the sensitivity to temperature changes is, is that we are increasing the temperature difference between the glacier and the interglacial cycle by a stepwise decrease of the base level temperature by a uh, 0.1 degrees. And so this is just a, um, I'm just showing um, a model. This is like just an example of how our model output looks like. So we are looking, it's a bird view. We are seeing Kakaya here and we are driving with a temperature difference of one degree and you can see like the advances, uh, advances and the retreats of the glaciers just based on uh, a change of temperature being the glacier and interglacial. Uh, cycles. And so we are looking at um, some of the results here. So that is the observed ice cover that we see in the modern. Uh, on the right hand side we see uh, a model output for surface temperatures and in, uh, in blue I highlight the area that is characterized by temperatures below uh, zero degrees C. So that's where the model generally simulates snowfall. And so what we can see here is that with a, temp with a base level temperatures of 27.5 degrees C and a left side of 5.22 uh, degrees C per kilometers, we simulate an area that is characterized by, below free uh, by temperatures below the freezing point that looks very similar to the modern ice uh, cap. So we are looking, the next picture is a view from the west to the north, northeast. So that's the Huascane Valley and um, 
that's what this error here shows. And so this is a model output. We are trying to see it in kind of a 3D view. So we have this mountain range here is that one. We see the very steep valley here that is produced here. And um, to compare the extent of the glaciers, what we look here is a topographic profile through um, the Wankane Valley. So we have the distance from the crest on the x-axis. We have elevation on the y-axis. The white line is the topography. The orange here is the modern ice extent from the observations. And these errors are showing the glacier extent um, at the different times. We are looking at our model output, again, that's like the Juan Cane uh, Glacier. We are using, again, a temperature, a basal temperature of 27.5 degrees C. We can see that we very well uh, simulate the modern ice extent, but we are a little bit underestimating the overall thickness of um, the ice sheet. With a temperature drop of around 0.4 to 0.5 degrees C, we are simulating a glacier advance that is similar to what is observed during the Little Ice Age. A temperature drop by 0.7 degrees C um, is uh, consistent with the Huan Cane uh, moraines uh, too uh, at 12,500 years. And to actually simulate the extent of the LGM moraines, we only need a temperature difference of 1.1 to 1.2 degrees C. So uh, that is kind of consistent um, with the Margot project, but again, at the very low end of temperature ranges that have been suggested. Uh, we can look at the ELA, so um, the equilibrium line altitudes, and uh, they have been calculated uh, for the modern to be at around 5,300 meters at the uh, Huan Cane Valley, and uh, LGM ELAs at around 5,070 meters. So we have a range of ELAs between the modern and the LGM of around 230 meters. So what we can see here is that in the modern, we are a little bit overestimating the ELA, but for the Little Ice Age, uh, 12,500 years and 17,000 years, we actually are within the range of the um, proposed uh, ELAs of the modern and the LGM. So what I wanted to show with like this kind, the series of slides is that we are able to model or to simulate the extent of the glaciers uh, very well, but also it suggests that we have a very, very strong sensitivity of the glaciers to temperature changes. And so then one of the questions is, is the temperature really the only thing that drives, that drives uh, these glacier advances? And so what we see here is precipitation on the left and temperature on the right. That's, um, again, model output. And so what I want to highlight here is that we are able to simulate very low temperature, uh, very low precipitation rates of around 0.6 to 0.7 over the uh, glacier itself or over the ice cap itself. And we are uh, able to resolve a precipitation gradient with slightly higher precipitation in the northwest and slightly drier conditions in the southeast. And so the temperature that we simulate is slightly, um, slightly lower than what we observe. But again, the area that is below freezing, uh, that, is, uh, that has a temperature below freezing, um, is very similar to what we see in terms of the ice extent. And so what I want you to focus on uh, in the next couple of slides is um, I'm showing the precipitation and temperature for the different time frames. And so what you will see is actually a decrease in precipitation. So we are going from the wetter green and blue colors to like the drier yellow and lighter green colors. And then the temperature is um, obviously decreasing. So we are going from the warmer yellow to the darker blue. And so going from the present and going through to the Little Ice Age, 12,500 years, 17,000 years, um, you can see uh, the decrease in both temperature and precipitation. And if we are actually looking at the difference between the modern and the LGM, what we see is that the temperature over um, Kekaya itself shows uh, a reduction of around 1.4 to 1.8 degrees C uh, in the LGM. We are looking at the precipitation. What we can see is that over Kakaya itself, we have around 80 to 85% precipitation um, during the LGM and in these 
bigger values, we even reduce the precipitation more than that. What we also see is that we have very localized increase in precipitation in these small uh, valleys on the southeast side. And so what this generally suggests is, again, that we have a very strong sensibility to temperature, um, but not to precipitation, because it's very hard to explain a glacier extent with decreasing precipitation. But what we also see is that um, if we are comparing different glaciers on the different sides of um, the Kaikaya ice cap here, the one that we've seen before, the topography with the different ice scenarios, and um, if we are comparing the Huancane Valley to another valley on the northwest side of Kalkaya, what we see is that the overall spatial scale is very similar. So we have glacier advances um, in the order of 10 kilometers for uh, the LGM or even uh, less temperature changes. But if we are going to the southeast side of the uh, Kakaya ice cap, we see that the uh, spatial scale is much, much smaller. So we have an advance uh, in glaciers that is barely in the order of one or two kilometers. So what this suggests is that the glacier advances, advances are driven by temperature, but the overall size of the glacier and um, the thickness of the glaciers uh, might be dependent on the moisture availability. And we see that also in the, um, in the valley morphology. So these valleys on the northwest are much, much bigger and they get much more moisture, whereas in the southeast, the valley morphology is like narrower and we have uh, steeper slopes. And so all we can say is that a basal temperature decrease of around 1.2 degrees C can account for the observed glacier advances estimated from dated moraines at the end of the LGM. And a decrease of around 0.4 and 0.8 respectively reproduces glacier advances related to the Little Ice Age and uh, to the Younger Dryas. And so the glacier extent and response to a decrease in temperature is relatively uniform along the western side of Kalkaya, but it differs between the windward and the leeward side. And so um, the implications are that the LGM in the tropics might have been characterized by temperatures where our temperature difference is less than 1.5 degrees C than the modern, and that means that even if we go for conservative estimates of future global warming, they will have a huge impact on the tropical glaciers. And so these are very preliminary results. So um, there's a lot we have to do. And one of the things I want to highlight is that these are only changes in the basal temperature. But for example, it has been proposed that we see changes in um, the temperature lapse rate. And so that would have a huge effect on uh, the, the glacier um, advances. And so um, I encourage you to see the poster tomorrow by Andrew Malone. So he is showing results from a one-dimensional flow line model um, that tries to get a better constraint on these climate fluctuations of the Kekai ice cap. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia. Um, have we got any questions? Excuse me, say that again. How do the glacier dynamics into account the advancing and receding glaciers? I mean, they're, they're, the how much they advance, and there's the glacier module in, um, incorporated into the land surface model. And so a lot of it depends on the glacier uh, characteristics, like um, the sliding velocity and like um, you know, the slope, where do we break, where do we have, like, where do we see um, avalanches, snow avalanches, and stuff like that. And so there are a lot of uh, these parameters that um, we have to have a better constraint on and a better look at uh, what, um, or how much it controls some of the um, climate pattern or, or overruling the climate patterns in terms of the shape of the Kakaya ice cap. And that's uh, some of the work that is still in progress trying to actually like uh, fit the modern record the best that we can do. Okay, thank you very much. Our uh, next speaker this afternoon is uh, Brian Manunos, who's going to talk about climate reconstructions from Cirque and Valley Moraines. Thank you, um, and thanks to all of you for being here, and uh, thanks to the co-conveners for setting up a wonderful presentation.
Okay. Um, so today I'd like to tell you two things. Uh, the first thing is um, just really give you an update of some of the chronologies we're building down in South America, southernmost Patagonia, and also in Western Canada. But the thing that I find more interesting is the complexity of how ice sheets decay and how size um, doesn't really matter in many cases. And so I'll give you some examples of that. We have a fairly large group of investigators working on this, um, so I would like to acknowledge them too. What I'll do is I'll first uh, t briefly touch on the methods we're using. I'll take you down to southernmost Patagonia, show you some of the examples we have there, then take you back up to um, this part of the world in British Columbia, really give you an idea of our working hypothesis and, and touch on where we'd like to go from this uh, or, or from here on out. Um, and that includes doing some modeling that I won't have time to discuss today. So we've been using a variety of dating methods, uh, beryllium-10 dating, um, and those samples have been processed both at Columbia and at Purdue by Brent Goring, one of the co-authors. We've also used uh, radiocarbon dating where appropriate and from uh, moraines and bogs, um, often behind some of these larger moraines, and I'll talk about that. And we've used the, the Balco et al. production rate for beryllium-10, and for this talk, I'll be reporting ages as calibrated uh, kilo years and express those ages, the central tendency, with a median and uh, mean error for those, for those ages and two sigma for C14 ages. And sometimes I'll refer to um, ELA depressions, and I'll just use a, a standard adiabatic lapse rate, but of course we all recognize that these glaciers are driven by both uh, temperature and precipitation. We haven't really done that yet, but just to give us an idea of the magnitude of the advances. So first, moving down to uh, southernmost Patagonia, uh, most of our work has been in this part, so down around Ushuaia, here's the Beagle Channel. It's on the lee side of the uh, Cordillera Darwin. So the contemporary ice cover is quite small in these cirques and uh, high mountain settings. And the colors here denote two, two groups of moraines. The yellow denotes those moraines that are closest to the contemporary ice limits. They're within about 10 to 100 meters of current ice extent. And then the ones that I'll talk about in this presentation are these ones denoted here in red. These are larger moraines, sometimes one to two kilometers, and sometimes paired termini that extend, um, in some cases with ELA depressions of several hundred meters below contemporary. And what we find is a lot of these moraines seem to be concentrated in an area of topographic high. Um, Ushuaia is located right here. These red, again, these red lines denote the, the moraines themselves that we've been describing and detailing. I'm going to focus most of t the presentation today just talking about CERC B here, but I will refer to the results from CERC A and also from another site, Laguna Esmeralda. So this particular setting is uh, fairly uh, well, there's a quite a well-preserved uh, end moraine here, and with a uppermost late, late Holocene moraine, believed to be Little Ice Age, we have a number of beryllium-10 ages from this particular outermost moraine, and they seem to be clustering more or less around 13,500 years. In addition to uh, the boulders from the moraine crest, we also have an age immediately outside at about 15,000, and then one in this upper pass here at about 16,000. And so just to put that particular group of ages and some of the others in, in a context, I've just put these on in association with the Dome C temperature reconstruction by Epica, and I've also highlighted the, um, this ACR, this Antarctic cold reversal period, and then the corresponding Younger Dryas chronosome. We see that at least for CERC B, they seem to be falling more or less along um, this, this area here. Again, this is median and the median age and associated range. And we also have some beryllium-10 ages from this uh, nearby CERC 
with a minimum limiting age from this particular CERC and also from the past in CERC B. So it, we're not certainly the first to say that uh, glaciers advanced during the Antarctic cold reversal. There's been a lot of work of late that's occurring in the northern um, Patagonian ice fields. For this particular study, though, at least these particular moraines themselves are directly sourced from these small cirques. And, it, and their um, high, high concentration in this topographic high, we think, has a lot to do with that particular region undergoing ice decay first. I want to now move you um, 100 degrees or so of latitude up to western North America. And I'm going to be referring to some sites in southernmost British Columbia here. Here's Seattle. I'm going to first take you, though, up to this portion of north central BC in the Cassier Mountains, and then we'll come back to these areas here. I will refer to Crowfoot Moraine, and that's very similar to some of the sites that we're finding in the south here. So moving first up to north central BC, this is the Cassier Mountains. This is an area that we've been doing some work over the last um, Five to, six, five to six years um, initially was started with a student. And we, in many cases, have located and described these extensive moraines in this part of the Canadian Cordillera. In some cases, these moraines extend four to eight kilometers beyond the, the end margins of little ice age deposits. So truly large sort of features. We also know from a variety of marginal positions around the Cordillera that this area was covered, fully covered, by an ice sheet um, six, 16,000 years ago. We just don't know what really happened and how quickly that ice sheet had underwent decay. So I'm going to first uh, talk about this area here. So we've obtained a number of beryllium-10 ages from um, two sides uh, of an extensive end moraine here and a lateral moraine. You can see it in the hill-shaded DEM. Here's a second one. And if you look carefully on this DEM, you see a lot of these features throughout this region. Here, too, is an area of topographic high. We, we've certainly got some ages that would uh, most people would consider to be outliers, and we're using the median age. But if you look at all of these uh, groups of moraines, or the group of ages, rather, they come to around 13,000. If we go um, about 100 kilometers to the southeast at a second site, this is one that we in had initially visited. We obtained some minimum limiting ages from lakes that were cored several years ago for about 10 and a half and uh, 10,000 years. That's now been supplemented with three additional beryllium-10 ages on a very large ladder more lateral moraine here that constrains, uh, there's, there's a lake here at about 11, 11 and a half. So we've pushed that back a little bit. We, we think it's the same age as the, um, the, the samples that we're finding to the north. Now, it really gets interesting as we move to the um, southern latitudes of British Columbia. Some additional sites that we've been working on include fried, lit, fried egg, Diamond and Birkenhead. We're going to refer to uh, some sites to the south. This is Whistler, BC, just to give you an idea, about 100 kilometers north of, of Vancouver. And unlike the sites to the north, these particular moraines are only about 100 meters outside of Little Ice Age moraines. I'll show you some examples of their extent. This is one particular site uh, referred to as the Fried Egg Moraine. It's, it's named after a lake. We didn't name it, but it, there's a fried egg lake. But um, you can see the Little Ice Age Moraine here. And beyond that, this is the moraine that we were interested in. And obtaining three beryllium-10 ages and then also an age from the outside of the moraine, they, they're coming in more or less around 13,000. Uh, these are, again, expressed in thousands of years, uh, KA. So if you were to just look at those ex the ages and the relative extent, we might sort of say, well, m perhaps there was a precipitation or a temperature gradient that existed in the Cordillera at the time of the emplacement of these moraines. It becomes much more problematic, however, when you consider some work done by Freely and others, uh, or, well, Freely and Clegg, of a very large valley glacier that's well constrained here based on radiocarbon dating to have existed at about sort of this extent, 12 and a half to 11 Ka. So sourced from these, 
these ice fields here. So it's kind of hard to explain why that that similar age produces a, um, an extensive glacier when we're actually getting in the higher areas these very small moraines themselves. I'll come back to that point in a second. Um, this is how all of those particular age ranges fit with respect to the GISP-2 temperature record by um, Richard Alley. Just again, just put in here to denote the Younger Dryas. But there's, there's certainly some deviation between the age ranges there. But if you, um, you, would, you could argue that many of those certainly do overlap with the Younger Dryas. So one, one way that we could perhaps explain this, our hypothesis, if you will, is that under, underneath an ice sheet such as the Cordillera, um, after about 16,000 years, as it starts to undergo rapid decay, it becomes far more complex. We, in many cases, uh, and people have proposed, such as Bob Fulton, that as these ice sheets and mountains decay, they start to get uh, detached. You have very complex ice, source ice, um, divides that can feed many of these valleys. And we think that's what's actually happening. And that at about 16,000, it looks like this. We push it back to about 14,000, and we start to, through um, thinning of the upper elevations of this ice sheet, whether it's dynamic or, or changes, substantial sur surface ba balance changes, we start to expose some of those highest elevations. And then if we flip a cold switch or a, a wet switch, if you will, um, during the Younger Dryas, we can perhaps reform some of these cirque glaciers at the highest settings. And in doing so, we sometimes, in some cases, some of these lower valleys can also get thickening and perhaps a re-advance of, of stagnating um, chunks of ice. Uh, we've got some ongoing work that I won't tell you about. Um, that's really the hypothesis that we're trying to test is to now, um, that's our working idea. We'd like to actually now test it with uh, glaciation models, so drive it with some simple simulations to just see if we can, we can reprodu reproduce some of the complex variability of the extent and magnitude of these moraines that we see in the landscape. Um, I'm just going to go through this. We don't really have time, and I'll just leave you with the conclusions. So our conclusions are that uh, in southernmost Patagonia, glaciers did advance um, during the ACR in agreement with others about a one and a half degree um, temperature change. And again, that may also be certainly precipitation. ELA depression of about 250. Um, far more complex, though, is to make any sort of assumption of temperature precip in the northern Canadian Cordillera, and again, simply because we have this decaying ice sheet. And we're undergoing work right now uh, trying to better come up, come up with a way to test our hypothesis using numerical modeling. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Brian. Have we got any uh, questions? I actually uh, um, have a question. Uh, you mentioned in your talk um, the fact that we may have a combination of uh, temperature and or precipitation controls. Uh, have you any idea which may be um, perhaps more important in which geographic setting? Well, certainly everyone uh, invokes the westerlies in southernmost Patagonia, and I, I wouldn't disagree that precipitation is critically important there and how it shifted, and maybe perhaps there were northward and southern migrations of the westerlies during the ACR, for example. I still don't know what, what's happening with the YD in Western Canada. I don't know if we actually have enough paleo records. One of the confounding effects is in the central portions of the ice sheet, um, where you'd like to have good paleo proxies. We don't have them because they were under ice, so not sure. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Our next talk uh, this afternoon is being given by uh, Brian Wally, who's going to talk about uh, debris supply to uh, rock glaciers and proteolous lobes. Thank you, Jasper. Um, I'm going to be talking about very small bits of ice. 
uh, and in particular bits of ice that exist not so much as large glaciers, whether they happen to be in cirques or tongues, but in various places covered by debris. Okay, so it's a fairly typical rock glacier, this time from Alaska. Some protalus lobes. Some debris covered glaciers. And some other debris covered lobe ridges things, okay, for want of a better word. Uh, and we're looking at debris covered glaciers again in some sort of sequence from those. So we need to be looking at where is the ice, where is the debris. So we can call this, if you like, paleo rock glaciology. And the problem is interpreting how much ice, how much debris, and how those mixtures actually come to be. Not just the origin of the ice, but I'll come back onto that. Uh, but also bearing in mind that temperatures have changed as well. And of course, when we get down to the pressure melting point, that changes all sorts of other things. So essentially, we're looking at the ice flux and the debris flux, the ice rock ratio, in particular circumstances that I've just shown you from those situations, those topographic situations. And the problem, of course, is that these things have changed in time. I'm going to say a little bit about the mechanical properties because where the ice is disposed in the rock or where the rock is disposed in the ice makes a considerable difference. So, can we say anything about the absence of ice totally or the diminution of ice as it melts out? And these may give changes in the flow rate and that relates to the, to the two basic models that we have of, of rock glacier formation. Uh, and what I want to address is how might we measure these, how might we look at these possible changes as time goes on and what clues have we got to do. So first of all, we need something to be able to do uh, a mapping. Um, and traditionally, well, here we've got uh, altitude and, and changing climate and response uh, in the general sort of thing that goes back to, to Mark Meyer. On the right-hand side, we've got temperature and precipitation or water, and we can twiddle those knobs and, and add a bit of debris once in a while, sometimes as the glaciers are growing, maybe uh, as they're decaying. But traditionally, when we're looking at these things, we might map them, and I put these vague because I don't want to look at those, but these are looking at general trends here of uh, the Pyrenees and where the glaciers occur in the Pyrenees, uh, and here in Alaska where the rock glaciers end and start and where the ordinary glaciers end and start. But that's a sort of a mass way of looking at it, a population way. I want to see ways that we can actually look at specific instances. So uh, I showed you, first of all, some general ideas of the size and what we actually call some of these features. So that we can map on here a matter of the flux. Here we've got high, in, high ice input and we've got bare glaciers. And here we've got very low ice input. And on this side of things, lots of debris input. We just end up with tailors. So mixing these in some particular way, we have a whole variety of features, but in individual circumstances, it's not necessarily quite clear where we are. If we take this diagram, then we've got the amount of ice and here the amount of debris, and you can see these, the brown splodges are the debris and the clearest splodges, the, the pale blue, is, is the ice. So again, we can mix and match those according to lots of, of debris, we've just got rock fill, or up here we've got lots of ice and it's an ordinary glacier, okay, with its normal constraints. But the problem with these rock glacier type features, protalus lobes, uh, is where is the ice and how is the ice mixed in with the debris or the debris mixed in with the ice? And that's rather difficult to, um, to determine in individual circumstances. So we can go into the field and have a look and see what's going on. And uh, the interesting thing is here in this uh, little, little cirque, we've got the trace of a rock glacier. Um, but next to it, we've got uh, a reasonable rock glacier. And we can look at that in Google Earth if we've got a reasonable um, cover. And that's what the tool that I want to uh, explore a little bit this afternoon. Now, we're looking at present day situations, uh, and we need to know something about the present day, even before we can say something about the past. Uh, this is an example, obviously, from, from Scotland. We don't really know what's going on. We haven't got a very good mechanical model, because we can't really go back that far into the past. Uh, and even on the limits of glaciers in the Alp Maritime, there are some paleo features, which we can make some guesses, but we don't really know, again, what's going on. So can we use things that are um, decaying at the moment with ice 
in the bodies in various ways. So we've got various models, protalus ramparts. Okay, here's our rampart, which may, under some uh, ideas, start to develop into a rock glacier. Here's a moraine, which again, with ice incorporated in that, may start to develop and move off down slope. Here we've got some sort of composite of a present-day glacier with debris over the surface, and I've already shown you how those might fit into the general um, topography. Uh, with the moraine material down here, again, possibly, uh, either moving under glacier flow conditions where there's glacier underneath the debris or, under some ideas, that there is massive ice within that mass of debris and that then flows. So let's just take that for a start and we've done some uh, finite element modelling. So this here is glacier ice with debris over the surface. And at we just keep the temperature just below the pressure melting point, but it's the sort of alpine situation that you would get seeing something like that. So that might be a typical type of feature. And we get around about a metre per hundred years movement down slope, which is reasonable given the fact that that's not very thin. It does cast doubt onto the ideas of the so-called pronymal ridges or protalus ramparts, whether it's actually snow or glacier ice, but I don't want to go in that direction this afternoon. If, however, we dispose our... Um, rock debris with bits of ice in between, it's the ice flows and the debris around about surrounding those blocks of ice uh, provides a resistance to it. And in this case, we get much lower velocities, uh, 1.25 meters per 10,000 years. And of course, that depends on, on where the ice is and in particular where the debris is. So we've got situations which are possible to model, albeit in a rather crude way, but it gives us some sort of limits on what we're actually looking at. So I now want to sort of talk about the epidemiology of these, these features, um, to go from the past through the present and to look about what may happen in the future. So what are we looking at? So we're looking at populations, and we've got a reasonable number of databases available for rock glacier-like features, but the trouble is that we're not always quite sure that they're talking about the same things. So the way I'm going to look at it is falsification of the least preferred paradigm, and that at the moment is the glacier ice cord model. So can we use Google Earth and ground truthing to test this epidemiology? Can we actually see uh, an outbreak of, if you like, ice exposures? And I think that we can actually, and this is what I'm suggesting, that as we get more uh, warming taking place, then this ice will become visible. Do we actually see that in practice? So we're going to look at some map comparisons uh, all right. Map comparisons, some uh, aerial photographs with, with Google Earth, uh, and some individuals for ground truthing. We start off this, um, this has been published quite a long time now, a rock glacier in Iceland, and we've got ice exposures at the snout, variously up the central furrow, merging into a small uh, cirque glacier up here. And that's really not much of a problem. We've got massive ice there. And one consequence of that is that these are three cross sections with what appear to be moraines at the outer edges, stable lateral uh, ridges, and there's a reduction in the amount of, um, if you like, take a projection across here, the amount of ice that's melted in a given time. We don't know how long that is, but we can stick these values back and, through the flow law, calculate what the sort of velocity would be when the ice was coming up here. And if you like, you're modeling this as a debris-covered glacier. Here's the same sort of thing carried out for Marinet Rock Glacier, and you can see I've drawn the line across here, and there's a dip here, and a dip here, and a much smaller dip here. So we do the same sort of process, we can back calculate, if you like, and get velocities in the past, which are order of tens of meters rather than what we now measure of a few meters or perhaps less per year. In other words, we've got the situation of a debris-covered glacier, which actually looks like a rock glacier, and it's decayed over time as the ice melts out. At Gruben Glacier in, uh, in Switzerland, we've got our original rock glacier, but then th that mapping has had to be modified as ice exposures in various places have, have occurred. So here is uh, an ice down lake. Well, it was a, a sort of thermocast pond, and there's massive glacier ice in here and in here, and that's retreated 
down to this sort of situation. So what we would expect over time is that we're getting more exposures of these thermocast ponds with glacier ice being exposed in it. So if you like, we can make a prediction from that. Can we see any, I uh, apologize for this, because this is a state of Google Earth at the moment. But this is a photograph that appeared, it was probably taken around about the 1990s. Uh, and this thermocast pond, which is a fairly massive one, is this one here. This here looks as if it's getting more uh, developed over time. And of course, we're now limited to what we can see in Google Earth. If we go to a situation in uh, more southern Alps of New Zealand, we've got a little glacier tongue here, which is this one over here. And we can see that in this particular case, we've got a glacier lobe with ice on the top. This is it here in more detail. But down on the valley sides, we don't appear to have any rock glacier formation or protalus lobe formation at all. So this will be an interesting one to have a look at uh, if we're getting a development of ice exposures in there. Okay, so those are the situations. In the Wrangell Mountains, Alaska, we've got some nice rock glaciers. I showed you one of those right at the beginning, with rock glaciers on the valley floor, none on the valley sides. Are we getting ice exposures taking place here? Well, we don't have to have thermocast ponds, but we're getting crevassing forming. And one would predict that, and this is a definite permafrost area, we would probably get thermocast ponds appearing here if that has got a glacier ice exposure. Uh, nearer to uh, home here, we've got uh, some of the good mapping that uh, Miller and uh, Westfall did. Uh, this is uh, Kidney, Kidney Lake. The trouble is here, of course, that there's a snow cover, and that, again, limits the, the usefulness of the Google Earth technique. But nevertheless, as we're getting better imagery, and of course we can go back and look at past imagery, we might be able to determine, say, here is a feature that's been mapped. We can actually use that to see what might happen. So these are the mappings here, uh, sorry, the, the, the values. This is rock glasses 184, and the rock glasses, valley side rock glasses 105. This is a situation where they occur together, which seems to be actually surprisingly rare. With a bit of luck, we can actually go back, and here's some of the uh, Hobbs, uh, sorry, Howe measurements. You can see the end of this rock glacier here and, and the lake here, and under Google Earth, and you can take the measurements off, and that's gone about 10 meters in 100 years. So it's the order that we might expect. Again, it gives us a possibility for saying, okay, let's keep an eye out uh, on this rock glacier. And in fact, the village of Snaefels is up there. It's an easy one to get to. You won't be able to see any rock glasses on here. The imagery isn't all that good, but there is one here, and we can take that by blowing it up, and that little lake is, in fact, that. And it's starting to appear. So that we've got, under those situations, a possibility of using Google Earth with some ground truth to see what would actually happen in the future as the place warms up. Warms up. So we can recognize all of these things, uh, and what we're making a prediction is that active rock glaciers will continue to slow or stop, and they'll sink vertically. Thermocast ponds and pools and ice exposures will become more uh, evident, and if there's more forward ice, we should actually give us the opportunity of anybody looking at that, either out in the field, it's, if you like, citizen field sciences, or uh, observations from, from Google Earth. We have, however, to be very careful about what we're seeing, uh, and if we're using this sort of epidemiology, patients can have as many diseases as they damn well please. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Brian. We have uh, time for a question. Um, I have a, a very quick question to ask. Uh, do you think our sort of, uh, I guess, um, artificial classification of uh, rock glaciers and uh, uh, protolus ramparts and, and lobes and so forth is one that's subject to change over time as a, res as a result of global change. We always have this problem about terminology. What I'm suggesting, I think, here is that the ice will become exposed if we hang around long enough. Well, the I will be ha hanging around long enough remains to be seen, but I think we can actually make some predictions now according to these models. So the answer is time will tell, but I'm not going to be more positive than that. Okay, we better leave that there. Thank you very much. 
Our next uh, uh, presentation this afternoon is by uh, Babata Jikuturan, who's going to talk about uh, ELAs in cold, hyper-arid settings. Um, hello, good, uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Patpatr Jujitsurung, and uh, Alan Gillespie is my advisor, and we're from University of Washington. Um, and uh, today I'll talk about the equilibrium line altitudes in cold and um, high uh, hyperarid settings. So um, the glaciers, uh, ELA of glaciers, where I'm talking about would be. Um, uh, typical of these type of glaciers. So this was uh, taken last year in Kyrgyz, um, Chalpanata, uh, Kyrgyz Front Range uh, Mountains. So you can see the modern ice over here and the latest extent over here. So this is uh, small cirque areas in cold and also um, arid regions. Um, so I'm not gonna uh, lecture about the, what the ELA is, but the, uh, the concept of um, uh, estimating ELA is to, we can estimate the modern ELA and from uh, uh, glacial deposits, from moraines, we can date them and then we can estimate the paleo ELAs and that will give you the, the change in ELA um, uh, proxy for uh, maybe a change in different climatic variables, mostly to precipitation or uh, temperature. Um, so um, this plot shows on the x-axis we have mean summer temperature and on the y-axis we have winter accumulation, uh, annual uh, precipitation rates. And this uh, empirical curve was compiled using data from 70 or so um, glaciers around the world. So, and this <clears throat> curve tries to uh, connect the relationship between the uh, 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 summer temperature and annual precipitation. Um, but as you can see here, most of these glaciers are from temperate glaciers, which, is, uh, uh, which means they are mostly um, uh, controlled by temperature and a small change of temperature will lead into uh, significant changes in uh, mass balance. But uh, in, this, in this part, where it gets very arid, uh, very dry, there's not that much of a data available. And these actually, um, these dots are from Arctic Canada and Antarctica. There's not, uh, not much is coming from, from the uh, uh, Central Asia or any, any other dry areas. So, um, and one thing notice here is that this small line, red line, uh, was interpolated to zero um, annual mass balance, um, annual precipitation, and obviously uh, it, it was interpolated because um, the annual mass balance would, uh, doesn't uh, go to zero, um, and then if there was zero uh, precipitation, there would be no glaciers. So we need more data and more detailed studies of dry regions. Um, and this is uh, 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 Summer Rupper's uh, PhD thesis, and she uh, looked at um, change in ELA uh, in Central Asia. And the reason to study uh, Central Asia was that it, it's a huge mass land, and it has a lot of glaciers, and also it has a very diverse climate variables, and temperature changes very greatly from place to place. Um, precipitation changes too. So here uh, we have, on the x-axis, we have mean annual precipitation, and on the y-axis, this is fraction uh, of melt to the total ablation. So in the unity, we have 100% melt uh, uh, to total ablation, and if uh, it goes to zero, and it's completely dominated by sublimation. So as you can see here, uh, in temperate uh, uh, regimes or in, um, you know, with ample precipitation, most of the ablation controlled by uh, uh, 
most of the ablation is through melting. And as you go down to very low, dry areas, we have a sublimation-dominated regime for the ablation. So this is what uh, I would be uh, focused on. <clears throat> so uh, as for the re uh, reference, um, this, is, this would be the uh, precipitation range for Sierra Nevadas, and this would be the uh, arid regions. And today I will talk about this small piece of hyper-arid regions. So um, to address this question, I use, well, uh, I follow four uh, steps. So first of all, uh, I'm gonna, I'm trying to map glacial deposits and go out and see what's on the ground and uh, take the um, boulders from the moraines and that will give you the time frame and then the magnitude of change of uh, glacial advances in different times and estimate paleo ELAs using field observations and also satellite image data. And the reason why I'm using satellite image data is because obviously I can't go into um, every single glacier in Central Asia. So um, uh, from also from satellite images, <laughs> we can estimate the modern ELA. So that two estimates will give me the change um, in ELA and uh, combined with the uh, field data and dating, I would give that the change in ELA uh, through time. And then the last step would be model uh, and to, to see uh, what was the dominant climatic variables uh, for that particular uh, setting. So uh, what's in the field? So uh, this is a work from uh, Kapus et al. And in Kyrgyz Tinshan, um, the, as you can see here, um, uh, stage six uh, glaciers were very um, big. And this uh, left lateral moraine dated back to 70, around 70,000 years ago. But if we go up to the Cirques, the stage two moraine is very, very close to Little Ice Age moraine. So the, the e, delta ELA was only 50 meters uh, from the, uh, compared to Little Ice Age. So the, the, assuming we are, you know, um, uh, the, the global last, uh, last glacial maximum would cause the synchronous advance to um, all the glaciers, uh, but here we don't see that case. Um, the uh, stage two glaciation was very small <coughs> compared to the old, uh, older ones. Um, and this is an um, uh, example from Mongolia. So this is uh, uh, Gishkini Noro, Gishkini Range in Gobi Altai. Um, so this is the, oh, sorry, I didn't, uh, I forgot to mention the index map. Um, so we've uh, uh, discovered five uh, sets of moraines in this uh, small cirque uh, glacier, uh, um, small valley. And uh, there's no uh, glaciers now. Um, and the, the, the peak would be 3,500 meters high, and the, uh, the, uh, the very uh, recent uh, uh, moraines uh, is at 3,300. And then um, the number four, or the, uh, the latest uh, maximum uh, advance, was at about 7,000 years ago. So there's no stage two advance here. And then it was very surprising uh, result for us because in the uh, uh, mid-Holocene we would assume that uh, everything was warm and then glaciers would not be survived over there. But we see this uh, big advance in the Gobi Desert at 7,000 years ago. So what's going on? Um, so that um, uh, these two cases was uh, to see uh, to uh, show how I would 
uh, estimate the paleo ELAs. Now I, um, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about how I um, estimate the modern ELAs. So this is um, the satellite image produced uh, topography map. And then uh, from this glacier topography map, we can uh, see that um, the shape of the topography changes as we go through uh, the ELA. Um, and this uh, uh, satellite image, is, uh, image has 15-meter uh, horizontal resolution uh, so it's, uh, and 30-meter uh, vertical resolution, so it's uh, quite um, uh, useful for uh, estimating uh, modern ELAs. So, and the last and um, uh, uh, step would be to uh, uh, create a uh, static surface energy balance model, and I put uh, all the uh, climatic variables, and then it computes the uh, uh, different energy balances, and if it's in equilibrium, it goes, uh, spits out the surface temperature, and then surface temperature, if it's uh, uh, above zero, it melts, and then if it's zero, it sublimates, and then I cal calculate the total ab ablation. And here is not my uh, goal to reproduce or accurately simulate the position, but the, uh, here I wanted to try um, what climate variables uh, would lead to uh, uh, change, uh, what amount of uh, change in ELA. So here is the uh, um, small uh, uh, um, preliminary results, as you can see here. So uh, on the y-axis, we have annual snowfall minus ablation. And on the, the y-axis, we have elevation. So as you go up to the mountain, um, uh, melt, it melt occurs, and then uh, in these curves we see two different regimes over here. So um, below this uh, 4,000 meters, this ablation totally dominates, dominates, uh, dominated by the melting. And if you go up above the 4,000 uh, meters, ablation is dominated by sublimation. So we, we, uh, we have two different uh, Regimes, and then this is just um, uh, model uh, equilibrium line mo uh, results for different albedos. Um, so I'll little, skip a little. Um, so this is positive degree days um, versus sublimation rate, uh, and this is just to uh, test the sensitivity to different climate variables. But uh, one thing uh, just to say is that these uh, sublimation dominated. Uh, re ablation regimes uh, really dependent on, uh, well, it varies um, a lot uh, with uh, these cloud fraction or wind speed uh, uh, variables. So we need to um, uh, correctly parameterize uh, these variables. Um, so to discuss uh, temperature glaciers um, at global LGM, ELAs are very low. Uh, ample precipitation to be accumulated, <coughs> and ELA is both sensitive to temperature and precipitation. And in contrast, hyperate glaciers, uh, ELAs are very high at uh, global LGM, and sublimation dominates the ablation. So, and mostly, uh, well, well, usually glaciers occur where positive degree days is minimal, which is in, some, uh, uh, in high altitude conditions. And ELA is very sensitive to small changes in precipitation. So to conclude, um, so in hyperarid regions, ELA may be a poorly defined concept because um, these glaciers uh, can exist where there's no melting occurred. Uh, it's true especially for the uh, uh, paleo climate, like in uh, global last glacial maximums. And because the entire glacier surface ablates through sublimation, and then there's not clear uh, line of uh, ELA that we used to define at the temperature glaciers. So that's, that's it, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions?
Um, yeah, you can, you can say that, yeah. But I mean, um, so uh, if we go back, uh, so if I go back, um, so uh, at this, uh, so the, uh, this particular case is uh, from the Sotai pick that I was talking about in, from Mongolia. So, and it receives like 50 to uh, 100 meters, uh, millimeters of year of precipitation. And this, if you uh, see that after 4,000 uh, meters, it just, you know, uh, the mass balance gets zero all the way down uh, up to the uh, top. So there's no, uh, and I mean, this uh, mass balance uh, uh, curve just wiggles around the zero, uh, you know, line. And then there's no clear definition where would you pick that up. So. Okay, thank you very much. Our uh, next talk is being given by uh, Jeffrey Bond, who's going to talk about deglaciation in Yukon Territory. Thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, today I'd like to share with you some new uh, dates that we have from the uh, Yukon Territory that describe the uh, deglaciation of the Cordilleran Ice Sheet uh, in that region. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Brent Ward from Simon Fraser University and uh, John Goss from Dalhousie. Oops. Uh, just an outline, uh, study rationale, I'll show you where the project location is. I'll talk about the uh, configuration of the northern limit of the Cordian Ice Sheet, put that into some perspective, uh, go over the results and discussion, and uh, provide some regional context with some other work. So here we are located uh, on the western side of North America, uh, the Cordillera Ice Sheet, the, the uh, lonely brother to the west of the uh, Laurentide Ice Sheet, a neglected ice sheet to the west. And it's, um, the area we'll be mostly talking about here is at the northwestern margin in the Yukon Territory. The timing of the glaciation is poorly uh, constrained in terms of the, in, in particular in terms of the deglaciation. There is uh, a really a lack of organic material associated with the sort of uh, the, the glacial maximum adjacent to the ice or, or even within the limits uh, shortly after deglaciation. So using radiocarbon isn't really an option uh, for uh, reconstructing the timing. Uh, in a, so that's our location of our study area in the northwest margin. And uh, in addition to that, we've, uh, through regional mapping in the southwest Yukon around uh, Whitehorse, uh, the capital city of the territory, we've been able to pull together a, a, a sort of a glacial, a deglacial history for the region. Uh, it looks something like that, which is, uh, uh, it's, it's nice. You can put together these, uh, these reconstructions, but there is no chronology for it. We haven't been able to uh, really, you know, detail the timing of this, of this story until now. So we use terrestrial cosmogenic nuclides and uh, beryllium-10 specifically on glacial erratics on uh, these different surfaces uh, for the, uh, uh, the Cordillera and Ice Sheet to determine some ages. Uh, so this is the location of, this is a southwest Yukon, this White Horse is a capital city. Uh, that's the distribution of ice at the, uh, during the LGM. And, um, just to break it out a little bit more and provide a little bit more background as to what the ice sheet is. Uh, how it's configured. The ice sheet is composed of different uh, accumulation zones that, uh, you know, essentially um, fed different lobes of the ice sheet. So you have the St. Elias lobe, the Coast Mountains lobe, the Cassiar lobe, and the Selwyn lobe. And uh, over time, they, the, these different accumulation zones uh, grew and eventually formed a single carapace of ice across the southern part of the territory. So our study sites are located uh, along the northern fringe of the, uh, the St. Elias, right at the limit of the St. Elias lobe, uh, just back from the limit along the western side of the Cassiar lobe, which is one of the interior lobes uh, within the Yukon. And, um, and we work back from that, from that limit, back sort of a mid-retreat um, mid position at Whitehorse. And then down here at the bottom of the slide, a, um, an accumulation, or a, a a series of boulders that are located within the accumulation zone, one of the key accumulation zones in the Coast Mountains. So that's the series of, of, uh, of sites we're referring to. The average ages for those different uh, data sets is uh, shown here in this next, 
uh, slide. Uh, right at the limit, we have an average of about 14.2K. I'll get into the details of some of these groupings here in a minute. And as we work back from the limit, we get sort of mid-retreat position ages of around 12 and about 11, 8, or 10, 8 for sort of deglaciation of the accumulation zones of, for the ice sheet. Uh, so the first one I'd like to talk about is the, along the, the margin of the St. Elias lobe, or the limit of the St. Elias lobe. Uh, we couldn't find uh, boulders at the limit of the Cassiar lobe that were adequate for, for, uh, or for dating sort of the initial retreat of, of glaciation, but we did find some at the limit of the St. Elias lobe. And those ages were coming out, so I don't have the um, errors on these ones in particular, but they averaged about, uh, about 600 years. And these are, um, there's one outlier here we feel that's at 20.1, uh, 20, uh, and the other ones are, you know, in the neighborhood of 14 and a half uh, thousand years. Uh, most of the boulders we chose had uh, fairly, fairly large erratics, uh, averaging a minimum of 1.5 meters in height to sort of eliminate some of the snow shielding effects uh, from the local area. The second uh, suite of uh, samples I'd like to tell you about is located right here. It's just at the northern uh, extent of the uh, Cassiar lobe. And uh, we have sampled four boulders from, from that area. And the, the oldest sample was from uh, the highest location, actually. It's probably most, uh, most similar to sort of the glacial maximum age or the initial deglaciation of the region, so about 14.4. Some of the lower elevation samples were in and around, you know, 13.8, 13.9. And uh, there's one of those samples here. And those are about 10 kilometers, located about 10 kilometers back from the limit. So, you know, the ice has started to retreat at this time. Uh, the uh, second set of uh, samples are from, from the Cassiar lobe uh, right here, and I'll discuss those now. And those are located right within the uh, city limits of Whitehorse. And uh, the, the results of the dating there suggest that there was, uh, the deglaciation occurred around about 11, about 12,000 years ago. Uh, we got a bit of a spread in there. Uh, we also sampled one boulder here at a higher elevation. This is at about 600 meters higher than the city itself, which is located in the valley bottom. And it was, uh, it came back with of an age about, about 13 and a half thousand years ago. So um, based on that, we can assume there's been sort of, there was an ablation rate or a decrease in the ice elevation, uh, surface elevation by about 40 centimeters per year over a 1500 year period or so. And what's interesting about the, 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 these samples in particular are, is, is it's related to, or we think it's related to these, this younger driest type age, is related to a period of time when the Cassiar lobe was retreating south to the southeast, back towards its accumulation zone. This pause in recession is very well documented around Whitehorse in terms of moraines. Uh, it's, a mor it's a moraine building event. There's a lot of meltwater channels and very distinctive landforms associated with this uh, period of time in the Whitehorse area. Uh, some of the uh, Stagnation moraine and um, eskers and things like that around Whitehorse are very, very well developed. Uh, there's, in addition to the depositional landforms, there's also um, erosional landforms like these meltwater channels that are also associated with this standstill or re-advance during the younger dries. The uh, final set of samples I'd like to do to discuss are located within the uh, Coast Mountains uh, sort of accumulation zone. This is feeding the uh, sort of the western margin of the Cassiar lobe, this, this particular area here. Uh, this is just a, a view from a Google Earth uh, shot of the sample or the, of the study area location. Uh, this is the uh, Pacific Ocean here, one of the fjords that um, this is a town of Skagway and the, uh, the international border between Alaska and uh, British Columbia here. And our samples are, just, are located just north of the, of the border. So we, we have, uh, it's, a, it's a highly eroded landscape. There are boulders sitting around, mostly sitting right on bedrock. There's very little drift. Uh, we did sample in one location, I highlighted in red. This was a bedrock sample which gave us an age that was fairly consistent with the boulder ages as well, which suggests that there has been fairly you know, rigorous erosion of the bedrock within the, 
uh, within the region. And, uh, you know, the average age of, of the, uh, the various samples suggests sort of an ice-free conditions by about 10,800. So in terms of uh, a retreat rate for the Cassiar lobe, we can, we can assume from this data that we're getting roughly 35 meters per year for the, through the initial part of deglaciation from uh, the glacial limit back to about Whitehorse and where we have a younger dry standstill. And this is pretty consistent, this timing around 14.4 is pretty consistent with uh, some, some lake sediment data from, uh, from Antifreeze Pond in the, just to the northwest of our study area, which su also suggests an increase in sedimentation between 14 and 15,000 years ago. And then we have a, a uh, uh, an increase in the rate of retreat of the of the ice lobe at, following the Younger Dryas uh, with an increased rate of about 100 meters per year uh, back into the accumulation zones. And this also uh, is supported by some of the the um, the, the ocean information, the surface, sea surface temperature data from the North Pacific Ocean which suggests there was a, an abrupt warming period following the Younger Dryas and the onset of, of the sort of preboreal conditions. So implications for uh, human history um, in the area, I just wanted to bring that into some context as well. Uh, the earliest evidence for humans around Whitehorse, this is significant because we are located right at the edge of Beringia and so the unglaciated terrain to the, to the west, northwest into Alaska and, and uh, Siberia. The earliest evidence for humans around Whitehorse is about uh, 9,000 years ago in lowland sites. And I guess our, 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 new, our new dates suggest that you also have to consider those upland sites. They deglaciate at least a thousand years earlier than the lowlands. Some of the earlier, if you're interested in finding um, uh, earlier sites for human, human occupation within the, uh, the Whitehorse area, the southwest part of the Yukon, I think you have, to, you have to consider the upland areas in terms of human habitation. The uh, Cassiar lobe is uh, likely blocked human migration. Uh, through the Whitehorse area during the Younger Dryas period, there's a significant amount of ice still um, persisting in southwest Yukon at this time. This may vary to the east, but uh, at least in the southwest Yukon, it's, uh, there's a significant amount of ice. So in terms of conclusions, uh, the northwest margin of the Cordilleran ice sheet maintained its maximum position until the uh, beginning of the bolin Alarud uh, warming period or at the, at maintained its position until then and starts retreating around 14.4. The Younger Dryas uh, cooling affected the Cordillera Ice Sheet's northern margin, causing a moraine building event around 12,000 years ago. Uh, valleys in the, nor in the northern British Columbia coastal accumulation zones are deglaciated by about 10,800. And the rate of ice retreat increases through the deglacial period. Um, archaeological models need to account for topographic variation in the deglaciation as well in terms of if you're interested in finding older sites in, uh, in the Yukon. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Jeffrey. Have we got any questions? Well, I think it's a, it's fairly active. Um, you know, there's evidence that the ice is still fairly active. There's a stagnation period, but there, I believe that the uh, the ice is still being fed um, in the valley bottoms by you know th from active accumulation zones. It's not just shutting right off necessarily. Uh, the moraines are building. You know, there's really well developed uh, lateral moraines. Um, I think it's consistent with what Brian's um, perhaps seeing. We are seeing you know a, a, the the landscape becoming free of ice at higher altitudes and um, if you have a uh, you know initiation of a cool period that uh, you know those those smaller uh, alpine glaciers could readvance at higher altitudes separate really from what's going on in the valley bottoms so I think it's I think it's fairly consistent yeah. mm-hmm
Sorry, sir, just could you repeat the first part of your question? Isn't yeah. this a late match yes. compared to mm -hmm. other sectors of the Warren Foundation? It is. It's um, you know, some work along the northwestern margin by, um, you know, through Kristen Kennedy's thesis suggests that uh, it could be as that limit could be re reaching its maximum position or retreating from its maximum position around 15 or 16,000 years ago. So it is a, a little bit uh, uh, later than, than the Laurentide for sure. Um, so perhaps it has something to do with the coastal accumulation zones is, uh, is, is one, one possibility. You know, it's reacting differently from the high level precipitation that's feeding the Laurentide. Okay, final one, yeah. We're using the uh, Kronos production rates of uh, Lowell and Stone. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Our final talk uh, this afternoon is uh, being given by uh, Gifford Miller, who's going to talk about ice cap retreat in Arctic Canada. Thanks. <clears throat> I do have, uh, I have to apologize, but I, I do have to ask if uh, there's any press present that they don't uh, report on this, and the reason is that the manuscript on which the talk is based is in its final revision for a, a journal that doesn't like pre-publication press. So what I, what I wanted to do uh, today was place the, the contemporary warming in a millennial perspective, and to do that we're going to use the changes and dimensions of, of ice caps and glaciers from the Canadian Arctic, and the basis for, for this is really through the instrumental record to some extent, the, the questions, and if you, if you look at the, um, the instrumental temperature record of warming and, and you squint the right way, it looks like there could be some kind of low frequency um, changes that are going on behind that, and, and in the Arctic where the warming is the greatest in that upper left side there, uh, it's even more pronounced that the potential of some kind of a low frequency uh, natural climate mode of variability that might be in part explaining the contemporary warning, warming that's going on. And uh, we know what some of those modes are, and the, the AMO is one of those that's got a beat of about 90 years. And so uh, we do have an understanding that there's, it's possible that there are natural modes of variability that are contributing to what's going on in the, in the contemporary world. So that, that really builds up the question, which, is, uh, which we need to address, was, which is whether there are unforced modes of multidecadal cycles that might explain some or even all of the observed warming in, in the recent century. And the problem for us is that the instrumental record is of, uh, too short, and particularly in the Arctic, its spatial distribution is too poor to really resolve that. And uh, the other side of that question then, is it possible that we can provide evidence that would clearly demonstrate that the recent warming is outside the range of natural variability? And so uh, I'm going to take you to the, to the eastern Canadian Arctic where there's lots of ice to do these sorts of things. And to start out with, we'll go to the central high plateau region which is where there's, there's little relief uh, and it's at relatively high elevations and there's a wide range of little ice caps up there. Uh, and, and as you can see from this sorry state, the, the ice is in fact receding fairly rapidly in that area. And there's a very nice study that Fritz Kerner uh, put out a few years ago where he took all of the mass balance annual data from the eastern Canadian Arctic, and he showed that the, the yearly mass balance, uh, more than 90% of the variance is determined by summer temperature and less than 10% by the winter uh, balance. And so when uh, summers get colder, the ice masses expand. When the summers are warmer, they shrink. And so these changes in dimensions, particularly of these small ice caps, uh, is, is one of our most reliable proxies for past summer temperature changes, and it allows us to extend uh, our understanding of how summer temperatures have evolved beyond the instrumental record and get a longer perspective on the contemporary warming. The other thing that we see in this region is, uh, was, was observed now more than 50 years ago by George Faulkner, who, who saw that on these relatively flat plateaus where the ice is relatively thin, they act as preservation, not erosive agents. They preserve fine details in the landscape, and as well they preserve the plants that were living when the ice cap formed there. And so as that ice melts back, these little plots of vegetation are revealed and, uh, and we can and collect them. And we've extended that uh, to show that it's not just on the central plateau, but as we go out into the coastal, highly dissected fjord regions, uh, although there's plenty of fast-moving out glaciers you can see here that are highly effective as erosive agents, on these little knuckles in between these big valley glaciers, 
Uh, you can see this nice trim line. This is the limit of these little ice masses during the peak of the Little Ice Age. And as those are receding, those have also been protective agents and they're preserving landscapes. And I'll go up next to that here. Uh, now we're about a half a meter here from the edge of the ice margin. If you keep your eye on this little red pocket knife and that triangular rock there, here we are at it. And what you can see is that there's an entire ecosystem that's just come out about, about three weeks prior to us uh, collecting at that site. So we can take these little tundra plants and radiocarbon date them and get a date, in this case, about 1,200 years old. And, and so what does this date mean? This, this, there's two very distinct ways of interpreting these dates. Both of them are correct. Uh, for a start, uh, this is clearly when the plants were growing. And it's pretty clear that pretty clearly the last time that summer conditions were suitable for plant life at this site. And so we can say pretty clearly that these tell us that the current summer conditions are now as warm as this particular time at this particular site. The other thing it tells us is, is that this is when the snow line, so the, the snow lines above which there's more snow that falls in the winter than melts in the summer, that the snow line has crossed this site buried the plants and killed them in that particular time, and it's remained on average below the site continuously since that particular date until the most recent decades where it's come above it and it's brought them back out again. So two distinct uh, determinations, both of which are equally valid. The other thing that helps us here is that uh, within three years we get regrowth in the case of mosses or colonization by other vascular plants taking place that's rapidly resetting the radiocarbon clock. And because these plants are dead, the roots aren't hanging on very well, so meltwater along the ice front and uh, winter wind-blown snow quickly removes them from the landscape. So they, they provide a faithful representation and they have very little survival potential if they're exposed, only if they're under the ice. So what I want to present then are, are 144 of these radiocarbon dates that we've collected from more than 100 different ice caps that spans about 1,000 kilometers in the north-south dimensions, and they range in elevation from about 400 to 1,400 meters above sea level. And what I, what I want to do is, is to normalize them to, uh, to climate. And there's a fairly steep climate gradient where the coastal areas are cooler than the inland. And so we, we'd like to get rid of the climate gradient so we can put them all on a, on a common scale. And we do that by taking advantage of some work that John Andrews and I did about 40 years ago when I was a beginning graduate student where we mapped out the snow line across Baffin Island. And I know you can't read it, so I'll blow this up in the corner here. So these are based on sort of 1950s aerial photography. So here's like the 700 meter snow line in the mid 20th century. And then we've plotted all of our sites in the elevation at which they're collected. So this little site here is 180 meters. The snow line was 180 meters higher than the mid 20th century when it was covered. Up here, here's a, here's a site that was 500 meters for the snow line above the, the mid 20th century snow line. We had hoped that the date on this one is going to be different than that one, whereas this one might be the same. So for each site, we've calculated the snow line change since the site was covered and plotted that against its radiocarbon age calibrated. So on the y-axis or the x-axis here, we've got calibrated years in the B2K time scale. So zero is the year 2000. And on the y-axis, we've got the change in snow line that's taken place since that time. And so you can see that very clearly these sites are in the four to 5,000 year old range are somewhere, um, at, the snow line was much higher than it is in, in, the, in the more recent times. Now there's a number of ways you can draw lines through this. We've tried a whole range of them and it, for, the, for the purposes of this talk, it doesn't matter too much how we do it. So this is simply a least squares regression on all the data points that are there and these are the, the one sigma standard deviations dashed down there. And it shows that, on average, the snow line has been decreasing over the last 5,000 years. Now, there's no doubt centennial variability on top of that. I don't mean to think it's a monotonic decrease. But on average, the first order trend is a decrease. And that decrease amounts to something like 100 meters per millennium, so 500 meters in the last 5,000 years. And we can convert that elevation change to temperature because uh, Martin Sharp's group in Edmonton just published a pretty nice study where they, where they calculated the surface lapse rate on glaciers in the eastern Canadian Arctic. It's about five degrees C per kilometer. So uh, 
500 meter depression translates to about a two and a half degree C decrease in summer temperature over the last 5,000 years. And presumably we're looking at the orbital decrease in insulation that occurs in summer and uh, across the high latitudes in the northern hemisphere. Now not all of the data are, are, are on here. Uh, but from these data alone, we can say that the current temperatures are at least as warm as any century in the past 5,000 years. But there's five sites that do not fit onto that plot, and these are the more interesting ones. And these sites come from uh, the southern region down here. They're these sort of purpley diamonds. They're about 100 kilometers range in, in, uh, in, in the site occurrences, so they cover a pretty wide area. And they, all of them come from these little tiny mountaintop ice caps, and this you can see I've outlined in white here the, the vegetation trim line. That's the maximum extent of that little ice cap in the Little Ice Age. And we've collected rooted tundra plants in their growth position right at the ice margin up there. And in this case, the radiocarbon date is now 45,000 years old for these rooted plants coming out, which was something that we really hadn't expected. And we've now replicated that at four additional sites. We have five sites where the radiocarbon age is on rooted tundra plants right at the ice margin are between 41 and 47,000 years. So if, if you, uh, so here's the replicated uh, sites here, and here's the, the calibrated radiocarbon dates going back, all of them more than 40,000 years old. So if we use the same logic, it would suggest that the contemporary warming is warmer than any time in the last 40,000 years. Now, we were not uh, thinking that that was a likely prediction, and so we tried to think of what other explanations might be plausible that could allow us this observation to be correct. And the one potential one would be that the ice cover was so thick that in the early Holocene, we peak warmth of the, of the Holocene thermal maximum, the ice was, even though the temperatures were warm enough to melt all the ice, the duration was insufficient to get the ice all melted. So that was a, that was a hypothesis that we could test, and we did it by, um, now I've blown up the area. Here's the area. This is a, a DEM, and I took Art Dyke's map of the Laurentide ice sheet in the, the, at the last glacial maximum. Here's the maximum out here in, in, on the shelf. And here's the one kilometer surface contour at the, at the last glacial maximum. All of our sites are outboard of the one kilometer surface margin, and they're all above 1,000 meters elevation. So all of these sites remained above the Laurentide ice sheet. So we can't have residual Laurentide ice on them. The only ice we can have is local ice that grew in place. And it turns out that, as I mentioned earlier, these are all from very small uh, ice caps. They're about a half a the, the summits are about a half a kilometer across, and if you use the flow laws of ice, you can, you can calculate the theoretical maximum ice that you could sustain on these small flat summits, and that turns out to be about 50 meters. So we might have had 50 meters of ice. We actually have information on how fast the surfaces are lowering by uh, derived from NASA repeat LIDAR, LIDAR altimetry. And uh, the current rate of, of lowering on the ice surface at this elevation, 1,000 to 1,200 meters, which is the elevation of these sites, is about a half a meter per year. So if we had, 100 year, if we had 50 meters of ice, we have 100 years to melt it. So from that, we can make this now much more confident statement that the summers of the past century were warmer on average than any century in the last 40,000 years. Now, now 40,000 years is getting right to the edge of the reliability of radiocarbon. It's getting near to where it's almost nothing left there. And so if we look back and say, well, is that likely to be the most, the most realistic age? And, and to do that, we go right next door to Greenland. And you look at the North Grip record. And so here's the HTM. This is the isotope record. So we're looking at temperature, warm up, cold down. And here's the warmth of the peak warmth of the Holocene thermal maximum in the early Holocene. Here's our age at 40,000. There's nothing really back here that's likely to be that age. And you really have to go back to the last interglacial before you get a high probability of summer temperatures exceeding those of uh, the most recent times or of the Holocene thermal maximum. So we think it's most likely that we're looking at last interglacial plants that are being exposed for the first time ever now in the contemporary warming. So we can add one more piece of information to that and say, what is the current snow line and how does that compare in this, this plot here? And here I've put on our old samples over here. 
And we do that uh, using the ice bridge data. So NASA has been flying repeat occupation of these flight lines on the penny ice cap. Here's, here's the penny ice cap here. Here's two of our old radiocarbon dated sites. The other ones are just off the top of the screen up in here. So it's relative, a relevant observation for, for all of our data set. And in the, they come back about every five years, and in the 2000 to 2005 resurvey, it showed that the snow line was everywhere above the top of the penny ice cap, and the penny ice cap is almost 2,000 meters. So the, the current snow line is at about, is at least 2,000 meters. And if we adjust that for the, compare it to the mid 20th century snow line, it turns out to be an 800 meter rise in the snow line since sometime in the middle of the last century. And so, here we, we can say in a curve that even Mike Mann might be envious of, we've got uh, 5,000 years of summertime cooling that's now been reversed by a four degree C rise in summer temperatures in the last century. So we can draw for conclusions then 5,000 years of summer cooling, which amounts to about two and a half degrees C of summer cooling, been reversed in recent decades with a four degree C rise in temperature in the last hundred years for the summer. And that's despite the fact that the amount of energy coming in from the sun over the last, in the last uh, century or, or two has continued to decrease. So we've got less solar energy, but we've seen a four degree C rise in summer temperatures. The current temperatures are warmer on average than any uh, century in at least 40,000 years, including the peak warmth of the early Holocene when the Arctic summer insulation was 10% more than present. And you can't explain those observations from any kind of solar forcing. And so they really add additional evidence to the growing consensus that anthropogenic contributions to the atmosphere are now resulting in unprecedented summer warmth well outside the range of natural climate variability. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, have we got any questions? Yeah, so the question is, sorry, the question is whether there's, there's observations and direct measurements of temperatures. The big dilemma for temperature measurements in, in the Canadian Arctic is that almost all the sites are coastal lowland sites in the tiny little villages out there. So they're highly influenced by the, the cool ocean around them and they don't show that much warming, but they, they are not really speaking to what's happening in the interior and at these higher elevations. Yeah, so it, it's, it's a good question. Um, you know, the, the reality is that when we collected them, they didn't look any different than any of the other ones. They're mostly these ubiquitous mosses and lichens. And, and so we had, we had no expectation <clears throat> that, they, that, that they were reflecting something warmer. At, at one of the sites, though, there were covering the ice mass as it was retreating, not in place, but covering the ice mass, what, what we like to call Baffin Island logs, which mean woody plants about the size of your little finger in diameter. <clears throat> but the highest level of woody plants right now is one to 200 meters. These were up at 1,000 to 1,200 meters. They weren't in place, so, but, but it was a, there was a huge numbers of them. So there's some evidence in, that, in fact, at, the, at that time, there was woody plants growing maybe 1,000 meters higher than they are today. Okay, thank you very much. We'll um, leave that uh, there uh, today. So uh, um, on behalf of uh, my uh, co-chair, I'd like to thank all of the speakers this afternoon for their contributions and uh, for audience questions. A reminder that we have a second oral session tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, uh, just along here somewhere. And we have a poster session tomorrow afternoon. So hope to see you there. Thank you.